Hello and welcome to the Friday afternoon edition of the DTF podcast. It's just the DT podcast today. Our buddy Fanta is uh, the busiest man on the planet. The busiest man on the planet. He is doing the Big East Women's Tournament right now. I believe he's probably live on a game right now at this point. I think he is. Tio, they're they're. Uh, I think they're using him in studio. They're using him as a play by play guy. They're using him as their social media guy. They're using him as everything, man. Don Fanta is a man of. Uh, uh man about town um and i think we all saw him did you see him in the wild did you see him popping up in the crowd at the seton hall game sitting there in the stands they got him i did of course one's cameras that was like finding that was like uh somebody put it to us like finding a leprechaun in ireland or a panda like the panda decided to come out you know kind of deal in a non-working capacity that was awesome it's good how about the fact that our man john fanta takes his day off to take his Lovely wife Vicky to a basketball game. <laughs> God my, bless Vicky. My, my wife, my wife would have just looked at me. She'd be like, "Uh, no, <laughs> that's, that is enough." And Vicky's just on board, man. That's yep. good for him. Yep. All right, we uh we have some fun stuff to talk about. I want to I want to pick your brain a little bit on the whole Tennessee versus Arizona thing and and uh, what the the top of college basketball looks like who should be the last number one seed. I have some very strong takes on that. I think uh, we have to talk about the mountain West, the mountain West tournament, because you are in beautiful San Diego for a matchup between yeah. Boise state and San Diego state that I thought was going to be a chance for Boise state to, uh, to clinch a share of the mountain West regular season title. Um, they lost at home to Nevada on Tuesday. That kind of uh, blew up those plans. So we'll talk a little bit about the top of the mountain West and, and how much fun that is. And, I'm going to make you uh, a a former, a reformed ACC guy talk about the Duke versus North Carolina game that we're getting on Saturday. But the place I want to start is with the Indiana Hoosiers because on – let me make sure the timeline is right. On Wednesday evening, around like five or six, word kind of got out that Mike Woodson was going to come back as the head coach of the Indiana Hoosiers, right? Yeah. Um, I think it was Zach Osterman. Uh, the Indy Star broke news. Our Jeff Goodman was able to confirm it. Uh, this is something that Jeff has been hinting at for the better part of uh, about two weeks, saying that he does not expect um, Mike Woodson to to be let go. Um, and quite literally, 24 hours afterwards, Liam McNeely, the five-star uh, McDonald's All-American freshman from, I believe it's IMG, <clears throat> right? IMG Montverde. It's one of those. He's at Montverde. He's yeah. at Montverde. So from Montverde. Um, He's originally from Texas. He announced that he is going to be asking to be released from his letter of intent to Indiana, uh, which means that he is effectively decommitting. Um, and uh, that is that. Uh, the guy that you said was going to be the help that is on the way for the Indiana basketball program is no longer help on the way. Where does this leave the Hoosiers? Where does this leave Mike Woodson? And uh, where should Indiana fans be looking to point the blame? <laughs> I, it was kind of confusing the way the whole thing went, to be honest with you, because like he was the perfect guy to come in and be a part of the roster that they had. Like he's exactly what they needed. He shoots the cover off the ball. He's a big guy that can guard probably three, four, maybe some twos. And like he just, it, it was a match made in heaven by all accounts. And, and I'm kind of curious as to why I thought he had a pretty good NIL deal to go to Indiana too. Like from what I had ever, what I had been hearing, so like a big time NIL deal. Um, it, it's it's a weird thing considering the fact that the the second that they say that Woodson's coming back, he then decommits. Like was mm -hmm. he thinking that they weren't that they weren't going to keep him, so he was going to stay? <laughs> like did he just have a change of heart? Uh, the timing of the thing is really weird. I want to say it was between Indiana and Kansas. They ended up. I, I want to say those were the two schools. Uh, Kansas must have come in late and been like, hey, man, I have, a, I have some little, little different happening. And with the way everything's structured now with NIL and everything, like you're going to have a lot more football commitments to where they flip last mm -hmm. minute. Like that's just going to happen because we're going to have a hey, last chance offer right here. And I think those things are going to happen more and more. I think it's a big blow uh, for Indiana. Like, like, <laughs> look, there's been a lot of bad things said about Indiana. Like I – some would they have Archie did not win a he didn't even get to the tournament. They've had other guys uh, there recently that haven't had a ton of success, not named Tom Crean, and they're seventeen and thirteen right now. And what are they? 
nine and ten in conference. Yeah, they're gonna probably end up nine. And 11. Like, as far as like, what are we gonna do with Mike Woodson? I, my only thing is, is do you see a future with there? Do you see a future for the next five to ten years? And I would venture to say probably, you know, I'm confused at the, what exactly the plan is there, unless you're willing to uh, kind of concede that you're not a big time job in that league anymore. Yeah, it's. I think the biggest thing for me when it comes to where Indiana is right now is where does the growth come from? Like, how do you yeah, get to the next? Yeah, how do you get to that next level, right? And you know, I think we all saw his his quotes um, this week where he says, "You got to." I believe you, you can play basketball inside out, right? Well, the most important thing to be able to play inside out is to have the out part, right? To be able to have guys that can space the floor. I think when you watch. Purdue play and you look at all these shot makers that they have around the perimeter, there's a reason why Zach Eadie is able to do what he does inside, right? There, mm. There's a reason why when uh, when Gonzaga is at their best running offense through the five, man, they have shooters all around them. Like think about the team that went 31-0 uh, heading into the national title game. They had Drew Timmy. They ran everything through him. And they also had Corey Kispert and Andrew Nemhard and Jalen Suggs and all these different dudes that could just bury threes. Um, that's the biggest issue for me right there. And then like I, I just – if if you're Mike Woodson, right, and you have the roster that you have right now, and you're not going to have any of these five star recruits coming in, and uh, there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to hit the portal the way that that it's expected from you to be able to hit the portal, if guys like Khalil Ware and uh, and players of that ilk are who you are targeting, right? Um, I just I don't know I don't know where they go from here, and I think it's about to get kind of ugly there because I. I Look, if it, do you do we expect them to be able to bring everyone back beyond? Uh, like Khalil Ware is probably going to the NBA, right? Xavier Johnson, unless he can find a twenty eighth year of eligibility, it's probably Dude, he needs to go on too. He's he, he's he's hitting uh, was it DeAndre Williams territory? Yeah. So like that day, that, that dude, that dude was a freshman at Pitt. My first year coming back from Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a, I had a uh, two year old son at that time. And now I have an eight-year-old son. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, what are we doing? Like, yeah, come on, it, man. So I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I understand the frustrations that Indiana fans are going to have in this situation because I don't. It. I don't see where. I don't see where you get it back, and they're they're going to have nil money from from what I've been told is that they it's not like they are hey, not going me. to be hurting. Trust me. Yeah. I now know Indiana's nil situation. Yeah. People yeah. got so mad at me for saying, like, it's just okay. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I, I was wrong. I was yeah. wrong. Here's a yeah. problem with that, too. Here's a problem. Just get off on all of it. Nobody freaking knows what's true and what's not true. Mm-hmm. So even the people that say, well, Indiana has this, and you don't freaking know that. You have no idea. This is hearsay. It's all freaking hearsay. And half the time when, co- when schools say they have X amount of NIL dollars, they might promise it. Those kids aren't getting it. Well, yeah, that's a big problem. It sucks. The whole thing sucks. Yeah. The, the, if for any college athletes considering entering the portal right now, make sure you get yourself a good NIL agent. Don't let your uncle do it. Don't let your AAU coach do it. Don't let someone else do it. Get someone that actually understands how to make contracts. There's one kid I heard of. I'm not going to say who it is. I'll tell you after the show. Um, that was guaranteed $250,000 to, to transfer to a school. Right. Um, the first thing that he was going to get was a 25k payment up front and a car that he was going to be able to drive from one of the local de- dealerships to just kind of say, "Hey, this is I'm driving this car from this dealership." Um, he didn't want to go with an actual NIL agent that was going to charge him the the 20 percent that I think is kind of standard uh, industry standard right now. That's insane, too. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. No, he he went with someone that didn't put an airtight contract together, and that 25 grand that he got up front was the last cent that he got from the collective or from the NIL people. So uh, he's there playing at the school uh, out $225,000 because he didn't want to pay the, the the 50 or 40 or whatever fee it would have been from an agent to get an airtight contract. So uh, the problem too, the point. problem too is these freaking agents aren't, aren't switching their, their percentages around for college NIL deals. And, and the, and the, it's kind of a twofold issue because a typical contract, 20% of marketing agreements are given to agents because there's mm-hmm. some extra work put into that, all that stuff. The problem is, is every single deal with these college kids is considered a marketing deal. 
which we all know is crap. Like there's guys mm-hmm. getting paid a million dollars to sign with the NIL company or whatever. They're not advertising for shit. And like, they're just, they're, it's pay for play. And the second we change all that around, like you're going to be able to regulate a little more. There's a lot of kids getting freaking hosed. I was having a conversation with an agent last night. We had dinner and like kids are getting screwed so badly right now because one, they don't know any better. The kids don't know any better. And two, the way a typical agent contract is structured right now, that 20% is too big a chunk, Mm -hmm. especially when these agents are simply negotiating with the schools. That's all they're doing. It's pay for play and they're getting a 20% pay for play. It's insane. And they're considering it a marketing deal. Everybody's getting that. The students are getting hosed. The agents, if they're a good one, are getting bank right now. They are getting paid, paid, and it's crap. Tangent. Go ahead. Yeah, no, you're you're not wrong. And and again, uh, I think the biggest thing that needs to happen here to that will make things go to normal is uh, avoiding having to funnel everything through a collective and and just say that these guys are employees. Pay them through the school. Right. They don't have to be official employees, but instead of having a collective pay that has to be funded by the fans, you know, maybe just have these uh, billion dollar TV contracts that are going to blow up all the conferences that we love. That are the reason why the Big uh, Big Ten and the SEC are ditching everybody and saying, fuck you, college athletics. We're going to go do our own thing. Why don't you have yeah. all that money coming in for the TV stuff there? Let that pay for the guys that are going to be playing instead of having to rely on uh, fans to be able to donate at $50 a pop so you can pour the $4 million it's going to cost for Mike Woodson to uh, mess up another roster. The, the, just before we move off Indiana and go into the next thing, I, I just – what do you – if if you are in that situation, what are you doing here, right? Because I don't, I don't see how – Mike Woodson? I, yeah, I understand how – I mean, he's been, he was at the tournament last year. He had Trey Jackson Davis. He made that run, right? And I know that he has not had Xavier Johnson healthy. And uh, I am um, a little bit – I understand what he is saying with that, right? Part of the reason why they weren't able to get another point guard to come in and get another transfer to come in is because uh, everybody else in the market was looking at it and saying, you're going to give all the minutes to Xavier Johnson. I don't want to play behind Xavier Johnson. It's why you don't see depth anywhere in college basketball this year. It's why Kansas basically has like four guys. So – um, I, I am a little bit sympathetic to that with Woodson, but at the same time, like your job is to be able to find an answer with the pieces that you have at your disposal. And I just, I think it's very difficult to justify beyond saying he's one of our guys that saying he's doing the right job. I don't, I think it's only going to get worse. I think it's going to end up going down and, uh, I would be very concerned about where, what next season is looking like. If I'm yeah. an Indiana fan, to be frank. Yeah, I, I think there, there's two jobs in that in that bucket right now in the Big Ten. I think Memphis mm-hmm. is kind of – or not Memphis, Michigan's kind of the same way. Like, hey, do we cut the cord? Do we go ahead and do it? Or, we, you know, obviously Indiana's not going to. But, um, yeah, I, it's – where do you I mean, go? Honestly, like, well, you look, what's the, well, here, here's my thing. What's the upside? What's the upside as opposed to where's the baseline? I think the baseline is where they're at right now. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's the baseline with Mike Woodson. The, the upside is probably a four-game flip to where, like, instead of being, you know, 17 and 13, they're 21 and 9, and they're in. Like, that's the upside. But Indiana upside, in my mind, and, and, and this is just a history perspective, like 25 wins, 27 wins. Like, to me, that that's where Indiana belongs, and especially as, as – uh, adamant as indiana fans were about that nil situation you should be better that yeah. you should be better but that's according to the fans well it, and here's the the biggest concern that i have with that is let's just say they have uh, i don't know we, the the number out there for villanova is over three million so let's just say that indiana gets over three million three and a half million whatever it is four million dollars but that let's just say that they're not going to be hurting when it comes to a salary cap for who they can bring in this summer are you trusting that Mike Woodson is going to be able to identify the right guys to bring in? Are you trusting that um, he's going to be able to retain the likes of Malik Renault and Mackenzie and Baco when they both are going to have their one-time eligibility, immediate transfer, whatever you want to call it, right? Like, I, I think what you, what you saw with Michigan last year, and to me that's the perfect comparison, is that you had the really rough season. You had a team that kind of underperformed based on the talent that was on the roster. And then, oh, by the way, the superstar five-man All-American center decided that he was going to go head over to Kansas 
and uh and that left you in a position where um you had to go out and get Olivier Kamwa to kind of try to replace him, which is fine, and a couple of the transfers and a couple of the pieces and a couple of the freshmen, this, that, and the third, and it just didn't work. And yeah. I think it's very easy to look at this Indiana situation and see those parallels and see where this thing is trending. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the only kind of optimistic point of view that you can take here is if you do lose bodies, and everybody loses two, three guys right now, if you do lose them, you can – recoup them fairly quickly mm -hmm. and if your pockets are as deep as what bloomington people are claiming them to be uh then that's a good thing because then you can completely flip your roster is mike going to be able to get you to that to that level that you so desire that's that's kind of where i'm at with that yep I agree. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about Tennessee and Arizona here in just one second, but I got to tell you the best month of the year is here, which is why you need to know that we are now partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks and we'll have special offers for the listeners and viewers of the DTF podcast. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, use the bonus code FIELD150 to get $150 in free bets on your first wager with BetMGM, regardless of whether or not you win that bet the best part to yo all you need to do is deposit five dollars of your own hard-earned money here's how you make it work download the bet mgm app sign up with the bonus code field 150 deposit five dollars or more but at least five dollars and then place your first wager on any game and you will immediately get 150 dollars in bonus bets regardless of whether or not that bet hits most importantly March is here. Conference tournaments are here. The NCAA tournament is going to be here in about 10 days. Uh, and we have some fun stuff coming with BetMGM that we're partnering with them on. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops odds boosts, a couple parlay boosts, and a ridiculous array of prop bets for anything that you could possibly imagine betting on. You want to bet on who's going to be able to get an at-large bid? BetMGM's got that. You want to bet on Final Four Futures? BetMGM's got that. You want to bet on the highest seed to make the Sweet 16? BetMGM is going to have that. I'm calling it now. BetMGM is the king of the prop bet. So go download the BetMGM app. Use code FIELD150. And speaking of betting on sports, uh, at the end of the show, I have an interview with Jim Root of Three Man Weave who sniffed out everything that happened with this whole Temple UAB game. Weird line movement, weird things happening in the betting markets there. Uh, that interview will be dropping at the end of this podcast. Um, Tio, I figured I was – I thought about asking you some of these questions – uh, but I've seen you at a blackjack. Jim, I know yeah. where your, your gambling mind is, so I decided to just kind of let you have the day. No, no, I, Jim's the perfect guy for that. Like, really smart dude. So people who who don't already know the three man weed guys, like I have a lot of respect for them and their intelligence, even though I won't admit it's their faces. Uh, but <laughs> but no, Jim Kai and all, like but all three of those guys are just freaking really smart. And Jim in particular, man, he's. He's he, he's really good at picking up you know subtle changes and differences and in this case it wasn't so subtle so good on him Jim Root's the man too many nice things being said about Jim Root on this podcast I know I know he's I a Missouri gross. fan I felt gross the whole time he's I a Missouri fan ladies time. and gentlemen um all right uh Tennessee versus Arizona I think that the way things are kind of standing that is going to end up being the battle for the last number one seed and frankly Tio I don't think that that's a battle anymore after Tennessee went out in the last three games beat up on Auburn. One at Alabama, one at South Carolina to add that into the mix where they went at Kentucky. In the last six weeks, they've beaten all four of the other uh, SEC title contenders. They get Kentucky at home on Saturday as well. Um, talk to me about Tennessee and Arizona, who you think is better. And I got a take for you on Tennessee I'm going to throw uh, after you give me your opinion on this because I'm, I'm very curious what you think about this. I know who, I think's, who, who I think is better. Yeah. Um, you know, weirdly enough, like like Arizona is still really good. We just kind of fall by the wayside for them because they start a lot of games like 11 p.m. Um, mm -hmm. Just being on the West Coast, I'm, which I'm here now, it's still strange for me to realize it's 10 in the morning where I'm at. But they, uh, they're they still really good. I, I didn't realize Pele Larson, uh, Pele, has scored over 1,000 points. Like, mm -hmm. majority of that's this year, man. Like, he's, he's starting to feel himself a little bit. So good on them. Caleb Love's still really good. Uh, if I had to pick one out of the two, though, playing head to head, man, that'd be a monster matchup, wouldn't it? Yes. My God, matchup for matchup, that would be awesome to watch. I would probably pick Tennessee because of the surrounding pieces, and that's not saying that Arizona's aren't awesome, but Tennessee's going to beat you up physically. They're going to be able to compete at every position physically. 
And Dalton Connect, I'm telling you, some of these shots, and we rave and we rave and we rave about the kid, but he's a pro playing with college kids. I mean, even with even against Texas A&M, even against Auburn, even against Alabama, even at mm-hmm. South Carolina, like this is a pro basketball player playing with college kids. He gets wherever he wants, whenever he wants, and goes on 15 0 runs by himself routinely. Like he is a special type of player. Zach Eadie's going to win National Player of the Year and pretty much everything, but he's going to be number two. Like if he wasn't, it's if he wasn't playing up against a generational five man. And Edie, like he's the runaway national player of the year in my mind. Like that's what puts them over the top. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. And I want to put this in the context of uh, I really, really like this Arizona team. Like I think that they they can – I said it last night on the show. I think that they are one of nine teams that has an actual chance to win a national title, and they ain't nine, and they're probably closer to one than they are to number nine. Um, I've kind of come around to the idea that Tennessee is the second best team in America. Right. Like, I think UConn is probably the favorite, rightfully the favorite by the books, by the eye test, but they're just steamrolling everybody and they've kind of hit their best basketball of the season at the right time. Um, and the Big East is great. Mm-hmm. Not top to bottom, top to nine. The Big East is great. For them to run through everybody's huge. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I just, you mentioned the toughness that Tennessee has. You mentioned their ability to defend. You mentioned they, they still have all the things that have made them the Tennessee program of the last five years, but they have Dalton connect who is an ultimate difference maker. And Oh, by the way, like no one ever talks about this dude. Zakai Ziegler had an all sec caliber season. He is a senior point guard. He's been through battles. He's won games on his own, right? We've seen him go for, I saw him go for 26 points and 13 assists at Kentucky. Right. I just, I, I think that they are, they are as loaded as anybody in the sport. And that this idea that they, that just because Rick Barnes is the head coach, they can't win a national title is laughable to me. I think they're the second best team in America right now, as of today. Is that what, what the hell? What the hell is Rick Barnes going to do to cancel them? Like, like cancel this team out? Well, like, what is he going to do? I, 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 everybody's like, "Well, Rick will get in the way." That's crap. How can he get out of the way? He's calling an ISO for Dalton Connect. Yeah, that's like, all he does. Like, what? What are we talking about? He, their defense is always going to be good, even in the games they mm-hmm. lost in the NCAA tournament. Their defense was still good. They just couldn't score. No longer the case. Mm-hmm. No longer the case. And if Dalton's not scoring, somebody else is. I, I just don't see these seven, eight minute droughts of scoring happening with this team. And that's what ended up, you know, dethroning them last year and the year before. Like they just couldn't, they didn't have that guy they could just go to. It drove me nuts because I thought Julian Phillips could do it if he was put in the right spot last year. But Dalton Connect, he doesn't have to be put in the right spot. You just get him the ball within the area code and like he'll find a way. I'm just glad that we don't have to have that conversation about uh about Julian Phillips anymore because yeah, no, I, didn't, I didn't nuts. I didn't think, me nuts. I don't know if you would have been able to survive that again. No, I, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. But but Dalton Connect, like you get him the ball, it, like inside of Thompson Bowling Arena, like <laughs> that place is huge. I don't know if you've ever been there. Underrated venue nationally. I'm telling you, that place is sweet. But anyway, like you just get him the ball, and he's going to be able to get you. I don't know what his points per possession are. They got to be good. Like mm-hmm. he is in, he is an absurd score. Yeah. And you can't zone him. You can't zone him. And you can't send a double at it because of the guys around him. Yeah. And it doesn't like he can, he, he can get wherever he wants to get to. And, and my favorite thing that he does is um, there'll be times where he'll get a defensive rebound and he'll just dribble the ball up. Right. And he'll be standing there and he'll try to be dribbling it and he'll be looking at, where everyone is on the court and then he'll point someone out and he'll call them up. And all he wants to do is figure out who is guarding that guy. And when that guy, when he picks out the, the player that he thinks he has the best chance to beat in a ball screen. Um, as and that's, a pro. Yeah, that's, that's a, a pro. Yeah. That's a pro. That's a pro. That's what pros do. That's what pros do. You sit down. It took me, it's crazy. Like it took me until I was 23 years old to really understand that. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and now he's 23, 24, but like, like that that's what pros do. You sur- you don't survey the guy in front of you, you survey the guy behind the guy that's in front of you. Yep. Like and he's I, I'm telling you, I, I just don't know how Rick can get in the way of this. No, he can't. He's already shown the ability to just kind of say, All right, go ahead. I'm getting out of the way. Go go do you. No, go do yeah. you you got this, man. I'm I I'm, yeah. I'm gonna let you cook. Um yep. the one concern that I have about Arizona 
is, I mean, beyond the fact that Kai Boswell has been kind of inconsistent, he's finally playing great again. He's been really good for like the last 10 days, uh, last three or four games they've played. But uh, it is Caleb Love trying to go into Dalton Connect mode. And uh, look, I think Caleb Love has had uh, at minimum a second team All American season. He's going to be the Pac 12 player of the year. He's been the best player in that league. It's been awesome to see his redemption. I'm very happy that he's been able to be this player. There's also been moments this year where we've seen him uh, seen him have go a little bit too aggressive, get a little bit too shot happy. And I think that's the one concern that I have with Arizona when they get to March. Like what happens if Caleb Loves decides to go full Caleb Love and have one of his three for 19 performances? I don't see that happening with Connect. That dude, Caleb Love has taken 454 shots this year. <laughs> Shots. <laughs> that, is, that is so many shots. And that's not including his 125 free throw attempts. <laughs> like, that is so many shots. Like, I am jealous of that guy. Here's the thing. You want you have to have a guy like Caleb. Not mm -hmm. but you have to re you have to regulate when he needs to be Caleb. Like, and I I have no problem thinking that Lloyd's gonna be able to do that. He raves about Caleb Love, raves about him. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, guys, like, what is Arizona is what, 24 and 6? It's worked. It's not like it's not working. Like, it's worked. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't – I think it's a big advantage to have Caleb Love on your team. I really do. It's a matter of getting Caleb Love to, to buy into exactly when and where he, you want him in takeover mode. And that's in the last two minutes. You, you want him being ball mover Caleb Love for the first 38. The last two, if you need him. That's when you need him to be Caleb Love. When the game gets really hard and really slow, that's yep. when you need him. Or someone at the end of a clock to go get a at least get a shot. Yeah, up, you know? yeah. I, I think that he's been good about that, and I think he's bought in. And I think Tommy's also given him a little bit of a leash. Uh, Four hundred and fifty-four shots. Yeah. Imagine what he would have done if he didn't have a leash. <laughs> could, could, yeah. Right. Yeah. Could just for the, the record. Hundreds. The reason why Tennessee, uh, Tennessee, the reason why Arizona's lost early in the tournament in the last couple of years has been that they didn't have a proper four man in the modern college basketball game, and that is exactly what Keyshawn Johnson is. Uh, to, yeah, did you know that we have partnered with Autograph? Did you talk to yeah. Tom? Uh, no, but I, I did. Uh, I did quote tweet something that he said the other day. I'm sure that all he does is I, I, I commented on the Instagram post that he had the other day too, and he definitely reads all of my comments on his. I his was texting him the other day, <laughs> just to just to spark on the legitimacy of of our friendship. Yeah, we're we're and, all uh, like, and they are in the our field of sixty eight group chat. You know the one that we have with Matt McCall and Randolph Childress and Jeff Goodman. Tom Brady's in that. Like he's just he's locked in on college basketball. Believe it or and not, the, not, not Tom even and Chris, Mac, Tom, dude. Tom and Chris Mack argue all the time. Yeah, they Tom argue Brady, all big, the time. Big St. Mary's guy, believe it or not, like <laughs> he's from the Bay Area, but he's not not like a Stanford fan. Not a he's a big St. Mary's guy. Loves Randy oh. Bennett. Loves the Aussies. Um, anyway, uh, as we kind of hinted here, Autograph is an app founded by Tom Brady with the intention of disrupting the way that fans consume content covering their favorite teams. This is how the app works. All of the podcasters, bloggers, and digital creators covering a team have their content sent to that team's page in the Autograph app. Instead of having to bounce from site to site or trying to navigate the safer workspaces on apps like S, uh, X, you just scroll through S, S, S X, S, X, whatever it is. Uh, this is I promise you guys, this isn't a hard sell. This is the truth. I am, believe it or not, T.O., a UConn fan. And I use no. Autograph to keep up with all the writers and the uh, all, all the... Um, all the writers I read and the pods that I listen to covering UConn basketball in the Autograph app, it is really simple and really convenient. But the best part, every piece of content that you consume in the app gives you reward points. The more points you get, the more chances you have at things like discounted tickets to games. Or how about this, man? The grand prize, a trip to L.A. for the regional and a spot in the suite for the Elite Eight and the Sweet 16 games that they have out there in L.A. That'll be pretty awesome. And that was your idea. You, you suggested that to Tom, right? No, this is what I suggested, Tom. Actually, for real, oh, um, oh. we partnered with uh, with Autograph here to donate a dollar uh, to the V Foundation every time someone downloads the app using the code F sixty eight with a minimum of twenty five hundred dollars getting donated for cancer research. The app is free. If you download using the code F sixty eight, you can help us raise a little bit of money for cancer research and give 
autograph a try. I promise it will be worth it because it is absolutely free. T.O., the Mountain West, baby. You are there. Boise State, San Diego State. You are going to be covering that tournament. You're going to be doing games. You're going to be doing uh, studio stuff. You're going to be living the life in Las Vegas at the Atomic and Max Center. Atomic and Max Center. Thomas Atomic. and Thomas and Max. I said X was S, the Atomic and Mass Center. Like this, I'm having a rough day, man. It's been a long <laughs> week. It's been a long week, Terrence. It's been at the end of a long year, at the end of a long season. Uh, I'm ready for a nap. I'm ready for another cup of coffee. Now that you're in San Diego, you should be able to read that. El mejor papa del mundo, best father in the world. Talk to me about the Mountain West. Talk to me about San Diego State. Talk to me about Boise. Talk to me about New Mexico. Talk to me about Utah State. Talk to me about everything in this league. It's awesome. I am ex- I, I am excited. First of all, we were talking about you know Boise State and San Diego State. I thought there would be some more um, uh, coming in about a week ago. I was like, oh man, we've slipped up on a game that could determine the Mountain West. Well, that not necessarily true. However, there are still ways for Boise to get a share of the champion of the regular season championship. So I'm going to read this: a, a win Friday coupled with a Utah State loss on Saturday would give Boise State a share of the conference championship alongside. Utah State, and the winner of Nevada, UNLV. Mountain West does not utilize tiebreakers to determine a regular season champ. Everybody, therefore, everybody would be champ, and then only to determine seeding for conference tournament. So there is still some uh, things going here. Uh, mm-hmm. However, what a fun game that I get to be a part of tonight. I, I get to see Butler in person. Uh, Jaden Ledee, something has clicked with him. I'm excited to go over there and talk to the coaching staff and him to see – you know, what's different this year? Because the talent's always kind of been there. Everybody's just kind of clamoring for it. He goes from averaging, what was it, five points, five points, six points, eight points, 20. So it's like he saw the light at the end of the tunnel. He's been awesome. Uh, that This league is fun. It's entertaining. There's close games. And I'll be damned, Rob. I'll be damned. Every time a team from this league needs a win, mm-hmm. they freaking win. Like, I <laughs> – I've never seen anything like it, whether it's the scheduling, whether it's just they're so evenly matched, whether it's it, like there was a couple of games Nevada needed to win at UNLV. What happens? They win at UNLV. Like what, Boise State needs a win at, you know, arbitrary school, Colorado State. They get it. Like it's, it's, it is unbelievable, really, how, you know, first of all, good the league is. And secondly, kind of like, for lack of better terms, how clutch the each team has been in the top six or seven, just to be like, well, we really need this win for our NCAA tournament hopes. We're going to get it. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, no, and there's, there's two teams that absolutely need a win tonight. Um, and I think that, or I think it's tomorrow, actually. New Mexico at Utah State. New Mexico has to win. They have Gotta to win. Yeah. You don't want to put yourself in a situation. Right now, they are the last team in and on Monday's field in the 68 bracket. And oh, they, the tournament needs New Mexico. Yeah. And some, like, some I'm stuff happened since then, but like, they're, they are, um, they are going to be right there on the cut line. You win at Utah State, you're in. Like, I don't care what anybody said. You're in. You go on yes, the road and I you agree. beat uh, a team that is currently in first place in the Mountain West standings. Um, you're going to be dancing. But here's the wild part if New Mexico wins, on Saturday at Utah State, and Nevada win, uh, UNLV wins on Saturday at Nevada. UNLV, who is not going to be one of the six teams to get an at-large bid to the NCAA tournament from the Mountain West, would win a share of the regular season title in the Mountain West. That tells you everything you need to know about this league. The team that's going to be a seven seed in the Mountain West Conference tournament, Colorado State, is going to be an eight seed in the NCAA tournament. Think about yeah. that. That's it's where we're crazy. at right now in this conference. That's yeah, and, where we're and, at in the Mountain West. And if they win, they'll win eleven out of their last twelve games of the regular season. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like if if you and they win, like it's just it's a tough one all around. Uh, and hey, so let me ask you this: the way the NCAA tournament, because nobody really freaking knows, like they beat Stetson earlier this year. If Stetson wins the A Sun, would that help them at all? Yeah, probably. No, probably not. Probably, probably not. Well, all, all it does is it gives you another win over the field, right? If you're a UNLV, which means that you, I'm, that is one of the things that gets folded into the metric. So it doesn't hurt you that they win. And obviously winning will help like in, any incremental bump that you can get in computer metrics, all of that stuff matters and all of that stuff adds up. But um, 
I don't think UNLV has a chance to get an at large, but if you're the Mountain West regular season champion and you've won 11 of your last 12 games and you are playing your conference tournament at home, T.O. Hey, hold on, know. hold on. Why not? Why not? What? They have one bad loss, and that's the very first game of the year on November 8th. Um, but look, but look. Mount is not a good loss. They lost okay, to yeah, Air that. Force at home by – I don't remember what the final score was. Uh, but but they're in conference. Uh, yeah, it was thir- it was thirty two points. It was embarrassing. Yeah, but they like, were down by forty five at one point in the second half of the game. That's the, but they've <laughs> also they also beat Creighton. I know. Stetson, if Stetson wins their league, they they beat an A Sun champion. I, I I know this all doesn't matter, but it's it's. it's you know these really? It's, I'll, I'll put it. I'll put it like this. they're good. I've had I mean, them. They're good. Yeah, where the way that they're playing right now, they are good enough to be. One of the 36 at large teams that make it into the NCAA tournament field. I don't think that they have the resume that is good enough to be able to be better than the other resumes that are out there. Does that make sense? If yeah. you're just looking at who this team is right now, they're, they're, there's no question about it. They're absolutely good enough. But the yeah. whole season has to matter. Because if we only say, hey, they won 11 in the last 12, get them in, then why would anybody like pay any attention to do anything with the non conference? Why would you ever watch a game there? So, all this stuff right. has to matter. All this stuff has to matter. Uh, but I, I definitely hear what you're saying. Give me your predictions, man. I want your predictions on what's going to happen in the Mountain West on Dude, Saturday. Impossible, impossible, impossible to know. <laughs> impossible. I, I, I do think Utah State. You know what? I, I say that Utah State wins at home to, to clinch the regular season. I say all that, but kind of going back to what we were saying earlier, like if a team really needs a win, that team wins. Like, don't discount that. It, it has been that way consistently all freaking season. Um, I love Utah State. Big Danny Sprinkle guy. So I want I want Danny to understand. I really like Danny. Yeah, Danny's great. What I, what yeah, I, yeah, every about, time I've talked to Danny, he's freaking awesome. Yeah, Great what dude. I, what I'm about to say is not personal. I want New Mexico to win that game. I do too. For two reasons. One, uh, I, that gets New Mexico in the tournament. Getting New Mexico in the tournament would be a good thing for college basketball, a good thing for the tournament, a uh, good thing for the Mountain West, good thing for everybody, right? Um, Utah State's already got a share of the regular season title. It's not ca- casting you any kind of championship, right? You already won something. You can already hang a banner. Um, and two, I love chaos. Oh. There, there is nothing more chaotic than having like a four way tie for first place in a league like the Mountain West. There is nothing more chaotic than that. And I am here awesome. for the drama. I'm here for the mess. I'm here. For I am the so insanity. excited. I am so. I one thing you will never hear me say after 30 years of age is I am so excited to go to Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. You won't hear me say it. I am really excited to go to the Mountain West tournament, which happens to be in Las Vegas. Big difference. Like, it is going to be an electric factory in there. Just games on top of games. I hope they're able to fill it up because, you know, you know how conference tournaments are. They're a little they finicky. And whenever you're untight, when you're, whenever you're all the way up and down the West Coast, it can be hard. But Yeah, but the thing man. is, you're, there's always, there's always going to be cheap flights to Vegas. There's always going right. to be, there's always going to be ways to get there. And it's one thing if your conference tournament is being held in, um, I don't want to trash any city in, in a non-destination city in right? Fort Worth. It, 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 in a non, in a I know that's what you were saying. Go ahead and say yeah, it. Yeah, like UConn to, doesn't have to go to Fort Worth anymore. Don't have to go to Fort Worth anymore. Like it's one thing if you're not in a non-destination city. It's another thing when you're going to a place where you can turn it into like a, a vacation where you can have a blast there and you can book a a trip for four days and not have to worry about well, what the hell am I going to do if this team doesn't my the team that I'm rooting for does it like loses in the first round, right? Well, then you're in there Vegas are places to drown your sorrows in Las Vegas. Yeah, you're you're gonna spend three days in Las Vegas with nothing to do but watch sports and bet on them. Like there's worse things to do on this planet than what you would do in Las Vegas. Then so can um, I be honest? Can I be honest? I have the hardest time like sitting down and watch. I, it brings me way too much stress to sit and gamble on games. It, yeah, I, it is stressful. I think I've done it one time, and it was for a finals. It was for when the Cavs and the Warriors were in the finals for game one, and the, the over-under was like 203 and a half, and everybody in the entire casino picked the over, and like it went to overtime, and the place turned into a freaking 
it was a madhouse mm-hmm. in that place. That was that was the only time I've ever done it. But and it was kind of like a group thing. Like all of our six buddies were going to put in a hundred bucks, and one person was going to go, and we were going to celebrate or lose together. And that was kind of that. But the, I, I just, I, man, you want you want to add some jolt in your life? Do that. Holy cow! Yeah, what I'm going to do in the tournament I've decided this year is I'm going to bet a hundred dollars on the underdogs money line on every game in the ncaa tournament all 67 games and the last like three or four years if you've done that you've made a whole bunch of money um doing it so i'm gonna i'm gonna go for that ride i'm gonna be along there for the ride i'm gonna be rooting for every 16 seed and every 15 seed and every 14 seed as hard as you can possibly root for any of them so uh, i like it is, i like be- it i like watching you guys be <laughs> there's nothing funnier they're watching some of the guys from field of 68 like when there's money on it like we so, some of the guys it's so <laughs> funny to watch and people are going to be able to watch us do all that stuff too so oh we yeah go out there blast because you're going to be in vegas again like the mountain west tournament ain't the only time that you're going to be in vegas to oh uh, yeah i'm going home and then flying right back out hey do me a favor don't drink the water i, I will get you by oh. the water we, we can expense that making Never sure you're there for all four days uh no no more water from the water don't drink tomorrow. out of the faucet in vegas that's a fact <laughs> that's a fact <laughs> what, what did you your uh that day your lower intestinal tract was a war zone according to sources. No, that was it that was in albuquerque <laughs> it wasn't just in albuquerque it was in las vegas too <laughs> dude i felt so bad dude we had such a nice room too at least we had a nice room yeah. They took really good care of us. They did. That was nice. Um, all right, uh, Tio, since we're talking about gambling, I should let everybody know that there is nothing better than tournament time in college basketball and the college basketball schedule. So I need to tell you guys about our partners over at Rhythm. If you're into sports betting, you need Rhythm, the place for data-backed props and picks. If you don't know, Rhythm, which is spelled R-I-T-H-M-M, is the go-to mobile app for player props and game picks backed by AI's predictive models. That is Allen Iverson. Not uh not not artificial intelligence by AI's predictive models. Rhythm helps you make smarter and faster betting decisions across all sports, but particularly college basketball, where we have a full month of tournament games to bet on. Many of which are going to have softer lines at BetMGM than what you find uh, in the NBA or the NHL right now. So with Rhythm, you get data back picks for every single Division One game every single day. Users. Get free picks daily with the ability to upgrade to unlimited access. So if you want to increase your edge and win more bets, go to the link in the description and download Rhythm today. That's R I T H M M. Tio, I'm going to talk a little bit about this weekend. We have some unbelievable basketball games on Saturday, starting with the greatest rivalry in all of college athletics. That is North Carolina at Duke. You are a uh, you're a reformed ACC guy, so you are now just a Mountain West and Big East guy. I think you are officially anti ACC, but you're never going to be able to shake those ACC roots. Talk to me about this matchup. Talk to me about what this game means, and talk to me about who has more on the line. Um, I'm saying, hold on, like I'm pulling up the the conference records right now, but uh, North Carolina's I mean, a game up. Yeah, uh, it's <laughs> dude, both twenty four and six, uh, both going to be. Obviously, everybody wants to win that game. I want to say that is Duke favored by four. Uh, it, according to Ken Palm, it's Duke by four. The official lines aren't out yet. I, it comes down to who's at home with this one, and I know Carolina sabotage K stuff with two years ago and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I think Duke wins this one at home. Um, it's for the regular season championship, correct? Like, if North whoever. Carolina wins, they get it outright. If Duke wins, it's shared. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's um, it'll be a gr- another great game. It'll be another great game, it, and really the two, you know, I hate to even say this, but I bite my lip. The two premier teams in the in that conference, and for you know, have been forever. And after that, it's Clemson and God knows what else. But uh, that's the best way the ACC can close the season with those two teams. So, it, it, which team has more on the line? I think, you know. What'd you say, Duke? If Duke wins it, no. If Carolina wins it, they get it. Carolina outright. wins it, they have the outright outright ACC regular season title. Yeah, that's correct. 
And if Duke wins it, then they share the regular season title. North Carolina is 16 and 3 in league, and Duke is 15 and 4. But the ACC think, doesn't even I recognize the regular season titles anyway because they are. Yeah, they don't, which is, which is stupid. Which is, which is weird because, like, that's mm-hmm. kind of like we're going to pin everything on a three day tournament, especially mm-hmm. because it's always guys in the, in the first double buys that win that. Anyway, it, it's, uh, I, I think North Carolina has more because they have a potential one seed on the line. Yep. So they win that, and they win the SEC tournament. They get a one seed. I think North Carolina has more. I think Duke wins at home, though. That's kind of where I'm at with the two. I think Duke ends up winning this game. Um, three more games. We can roll through them pretty quickly. Kentucky at Tennessee. Uh, Kentucky's vaulted offense. Tennessee's elite defense. Kentucky on the road. Ken Palm, I believe, has this as nine, po- nine points Tennessee's way. Nine points Tennessee's way. That is a lot of points for a Kentucky team that can put up 90 on quite literally anybody on any given night. What do you like here? I I, I like Tennessee at home. Tennessee can score with them, and it's going to be at Tennessee on senior night. Tennessee's going to win that game. They're just going to beat them up. Yeah. I think you're probably right. Um, I would lean towards but, but Kentucky could, could score 130 points and just tell me to yeah. shut up too. I, that's, I would why, lean... that's why I'm I'm kind of on the Kentucky train. Like even with them not being able to guard, like there's not many teams that can put up 110 points. Well, and I had this argument with some the other day, right? I think that if you look at some of those other teams that uh, are elite offenses that struggle defensively, the Floridas, the Baylors, the Illinois. Um, the Alabamas of the world, right? Kentucky is the one where I have the least amount of concern about them having an off night because there's not just one way that they can do it, right? Rob yeah. Dillingham can go nuts. Reed Shepard could go nuts. Antonio Reeves could go nuts. Um, we've seen DJ Wagner go for like 20 and six in a game. We've seen Justin Edwards score 28 in a game. They have four different big guys that have all been really effective. They're getting Trey Mitchell back. Like there's so many different ways they can get it done. I just feel like they're about as good of a bet as anybody to be able to get you to about 90. And if they can score 90, they're going to have a puncher's chance of being able to win against anybody yeah. that they play. Yeah, I agree. I, I just, I, I, my cat, like if your offense is elite and it's kind of weird because I'm kind of saying the, the exact opposite for Alabama. So I'm kind of going against the grain, but like with Kentucky, like there's a lot of teams that can hold you in the fifties. Like, mm-hmm. but like, there's not many teams that can score that many points. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a lot of points. And, and think about this too. Just from a percentage standpoint, they're shooting 55% from two. They're shooting 41% from three. As a team, Rob. Mm-hmm. As a team. Like, they've played good defensive teams too. <laughs> and they're still getting those numbers. It's, 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 it's hard to even fathom. Yep. Um, one thing I do think will be really interesting is to see what happens with Big Z. He's averaging what like double digits over the last three or four games. Um, he's very clearly the best offensive weapon that can Kentucky use there, but he's also uh what's the nice I had dinner play? with some I had dinner with somebody last night that knows very much what's gonna happen with Big Z. Well, I'm saying is he gonna end up um uh, how much is he gonna end up playing here? If I'm Cal, I think that this is the perfect game to try to get Z about 30 minutes and see if you can toughen him up a little bit. See if he can kind of figure it out as you head. Because you're playing with house money. It's at Tennessee. You have no chance to win the SEC regular season title. Your seeding kind of already is what it is in both the NCAA tournament and the SEC tournament. So why not just see if you can't get Big Z to kind of deal with some of that toughness a little bit, throw him in the fire, let him play 35 minutes, and just see what happens. Because I think that's where their ceiling becomes uh, another level. If you can get him being um, more than just like a complete non-entity on the defensive end of the floor. Yeah. Agreed. Throw him in there. Yep. Uh, Houston at Kansas. What do you like there? I thought Houston had already played at Kansas. I'm sorry. Kansas at Houston. I'm an idiot. Houston. Yeah. Houston. Yeah. That's kind of where I'm at with the two. Yeah. Uh, Houston. I don't. I, w- I would be shocked if Kevin McCullough plays. I have no inside info on that. I'd just be shocked if, if Bill Self, knowing that he's kind of banged up and dealing with it, you got the Big Twelve tournament, NCAA tournament coming. Why, yeah, would, why you would you play him? Yeah. There's nothing. There's nothing for you to do. It's already the worst Big Twelve season you've ever had before in your life. Last one, 
Villanova is playing their self-defined Super Bowl at home at the Wells Fargo Center on Saturday afternoon against um, against Creighton. I'm Can old enough of, to remember when their Super Bowl was a national championship game. I said the same thing. Uh, can Villanova win the Super Bowl? Are they going to get their time? <laughs> Are they going to dance? It just made me feel gross all the way through. The entire thing made me feel gross. I, I think Creighton could beat them there. It's tough to win at Villanova. It doesn't matter who's there, who the coach is. Uh, I think this is a game that – the matchup to watch is Kyle Brenner and Dixon. Um, I just feel like there's – Creighton's just really good, man. I would probably pick Creighton. Yeah. And I don't feel, I don't feel good about it. Yeah, Villanova won at Creighton earlier, and yeah, look, I, I don't you, care. Yeah, you said it, the, <laughs> the 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 big thing is that Villanova is able to like they love dribbling into those post ups and try to do those isolations, and it kind of takes away what Creighton wants to do defensively in terms of running people off the line. And Eric Dixon shooting pulls Ryan Kalkbrenner away, but it's Creighton, it's Villanova. I'm going with Creighton. To it's yeah. been a pleasure, man. We're gonna go run this interview with Jim Root. Uh, and I will let you get to your San Diego State shoot arounds, your Boise State shoot arounds. Great seeing you, man. And uh, hopefully you can uh, throw this thing on mute so you don't have to listen to the sultry tones of Jim Root's voice. I'll see you, bud. See you, man. Welcome on to the field of 68, Jim Root, who is the uh, the best looking of the trio, three-man weave, and is one of our gambling experts here and a guy that I know uh, knows way more about betting odds, betting lines, and how to be a profitable gambler than just about anybody that I know. Um, Jim, obviously there are some weird things going on with uh, with Temple basketball, with the line movement yesterday. It's not the first time this has happened. So explain it to me like I am a 12-year-old. What is happening with Temple? What is happening with these lines? And why is there, according to Pat Forty of Sports Illustrated, uh, uh, an investigation opened by U.S. Integrity, which is basically a watchdog for casinos and sports books and, and, and gambling in the United States? Yeah, so basically any game has a typical projected point spread, and this is via Gamblers, or you can go on Ken Palm, Bart Torvik, any of those analytical websites, and they project what the score of the game is going to be based on how the teams have been so far this year. Uh, and all those systems had Temple versus UAB yesterday as UAB uh, like a one or two point favorite, right about in that vicinity. I think Sportsbooks opened at minus two and a half in some places. And that seemed right. It seemed okay. That's about lining up with all the computers. This makes sense. But then for about an hour yesterday, UAB just was getting bet like crazy over and over and over very publicly in, in very visible places, uh, sports books that would move the line. And it went from two and a half to three, three and a half to four, four and a half. And it just going up. And at this point in the year, there's enough evidence out there on teams that people kind of know how good each team is generally. So if you see a line move one point, two points, it's okay. That, that's that's reasonable. But anything more than that, you start to wonder what's going on. For me, myself, betting, if I see like a three-point movement right now, I'm like, I must have missed an injury. Did somebody get hurt at the end of the last game? So that was my first thought. Like, has your Miller for Temple roll his ankle in the final play or something and he's going to be out? And people know about it, so they're getting uh, against Temple here. And there's there's just no information like that. There's no suspension news. Nothing that would indicate, all right, somebody knows something, you got to get on UAB. And the fact that it got all the way to eight, I mean, six-point moves, it, like, never happens. It, it just doesn't. So started to get really fishy at that point. And you mentioned it wasn't the first time this has happened for Mem or for Temple. They played Memphis back on February 8th, and the line did the same thing. Over the course of an hour, it moved like four points. There was no injury, no real justification for it. So you just start to get a little suspicious on why that's happening. It would seem, you know, it, typically, like if you look at the Arizona State example from a couple of years ago, the headache Smith thing, um, a, a better is working with the player and it, that's, that's kind of how the relationship works. So it's not like the players are betting this game themselves. It, it would be somebody on the outside that's working with them and giving them a cut or something. That's what would happen if that's uh, the case here. Um, so just to see that kind of line movement with no justification, no injury, no suspension, that's when the eyebrows go up and you start to think something might be wrong here. Yeah. To, to put all this 
into context. Um, Marquette played at Creighton on Saturday. Uh, that line opened at four and a half. Um, word kind of got out that Tyler Kolick probably wasn't playing, and it climbed up to seven and a half. Um, and then about 20 minutes before tip-off, I think it was, 30 minutes before tip-off, it comes out that Oso Wigadaro is also not going to be playing because of an illness, which was uh, not on my radar. I don't know if it was on your radar. Um, no, Oso no Wigadaro radar. is like <laughs> an, an all-Big East center. And the line went from seven and a half to eight and a half. So Marquette was missing their two best players on the road, and the line moved four points in a full day. The Temple UAB line moved six points um, in an hour. Is this, have you ever seen anything like this before? And have you ever seen anything like that happening with the same team twice in the same season? Like, to, that seems to me. Look, I don't bet as much as you do. Um, I'm more the guy that donates to to bet MGM than someone that wins at bet MGM. But is that the, I, I don't remember seeing things like that before. Yeah, no, I, I haven't seen it multiple times. I've seen games here and there where I couldn't explain it and there wasn't an injury. And uh, I think back, I think the 2019-20 season, there was a Navy versus Mount St. Mary's game. Yes, I know, very obscure here. Um, but Navy just kept getting bet. I couldn't figure out why I was betting Mount St. Mary's against the steam. Cause I was like, I don't find any injuries here. There's nothing going on. And it went from like four to nine and Navy won by 11. And I'm not saying anything happened there, but there were no injuries. It was strange. I, I didn't know what was going on, but for it to happen like this, especially, you know, you mentioned the injuries only moving at four. It, it's like, think about somebody like shoplifting. If they took some candy and put it in their pockets, it's probably never going to get noticed. If you know the door guy on your way out, he can kind of mm -hmm. let you slip by with something small. But if you try to put a 90-inch flat screen under your T-shirt, like people are going to see it. Like this was so obvious. It's not just like workers at books. It's it's other customers, other betters were seeing this. Uh, it was just really clear as day that it was happening. Uh, or something, something was going on. The, the line moving that much is, is just so extreme. Um, no, I haven't seen it multiple times. And that's just kind of the brazenness of it and, and sort of the obvious. It was like, this is their last chance to really get a big bet in. So let's take home all the profits we can. Let's grab everything off the shelves we can and try to walk out the front door. And when you do it like that, that's that's when you set off the alarms. And, and that's, that's what happened. Yeah, so what does it take to move a line like that are we talking uh thousands of people betting 20 bucks are we talking about like a couple of people betting tens of thousands or hundreds of, th of thousands of dollars like I, I don't know if you necessarily have specifics in this case but um generally speaking for a line to move like that what are we what are we talking about there in terms of handle Typically, it's it's more about who's betting than the amount. Um, if it's somebody that has been a consistent winner at a sports book or a consistent beater of the line where it's like, all right, this guy bets minus three, the game closes five every time. He's probably got the right side. Somebody else is going to come in and bet. They, they know the direction the line is moving. That's when the bookmakers will move it. It's typically about the person. Like if Floyd Mayweather came and said, I want to bet a million dollars on Hofstra minus three, Maybe they'd move it some because they want to hide liability, but more it's more about getting the line right and, and trying to have the correct line. And Floyd Mayweather's not telling them that the line should move. I don't think he has any hostile inside knowledge. Uh, so it, it typically is because it's coming from a better that has been getting it right. And that seems to maybe be the case here. Somebody that's been winning, and if they had inside knowledge, of course, it's it's easier to win. Um, but that that would be my guess is it was coming from somebody who's been at that book has been sort of respected action. And if they just kept going, it, it seems like there was just no price they wouldn't take like, oh, you, you're just going to repost it at four. I'll take four. You're going to repost it at four and a half. I'll take four and a half. Uh, it seemed like somebody had extreme confidence that no matter what the number was showing, they were still willing to put more and more money down, which, again, another kind of alarm bell there. So I, I've always been of the mindset that when you have uh, let, let's just assume right that this is a situation of uh point shaving or something like that right just to just to to kind of put together a theory here i've always said that if that's going to be happening in a regulated market where you have legal gambling it's the kind of thing that's going to get picked up quickly right it's the kind of thing that's going to get recognized like it did in this situation you picked it up before the game even started Right. I think you, you were on with uh, Tim Murray and those guys over on Visa and talking about it. 
and the clip has yep. kind of gone like semi-viral and nobody is tagging you on Twitter because uh, your Twitter handle is second chance points instead of Jim Rue. Maybe you should fix that, man. Maybe maybe you should make yourself a little bit more recognizable. Um, but I've always said that having a regulated market, you can pick up on these things faster than if gambling wasn't legal. You're always going to find people that are going to want to bet on sports. That's always going to exist. And the way to kind of sniff out people doing bad things, and people are always going to want to try to do something like this because it's a way to make a quick buck. That's just the world that we live in, right? I think having the regulated markets is what's allowed you to pick up on this stuff fairly quickly. And that's how you kind of snuff this stuff out is you you keep those watchdogs in place. You have it be legalized. You have it be in a, a, a setup where um, people can very quickly identify something like that that is happening. Yeah, I've seen a lot of like, oh, the league's get in bed with the sports books and look what happens kind of reaction to this. It's like this has been happening. It happens. It happens probably more. Like you said, if it's a black market, if there's no mm -hmm. legal monitoring of it, I mean, look at anything that's illegal. There, people find ways to get it and, and the price goes up more and you make more money from it. Uh, this way you have a better chance at, at regulating it. And I, I would think, you know, if you do it subtly, if you do it small, there's probably ways to get away with it. Uh, in fact, I'm almost certain there there would be. But if you go too big, you try to make too big of a splash, and it, it, you do it at the wrong places, the wrong sports books, then yeah, people it up, and a company like U.S. Integrity is going to investigate. And uh, I like back to the Arizona from 1994. They did it for five, six games. It was almost a month. Like they they got a lot of games in, and that's when there was no regulation on that kind of market. It was just a a guy with bags of cash going around to different casinos in Vegas. And that's, that's harder to pick up, but people are betting online. You know, what account it's coming from, like we said, you know, it's from a winning account. That stuff is almost easier to sniff out. And uh, uh, it seemed like that was the case yesterday. Yeah. And the, I think most books that was, that game was pulled off the board by mid afternoon, right? Like, uh, were you able to still kind of get action on it as you got closer to tip off? I, I think you could have, and I, I mentioned it got all the way up to minus eight and then it closed seven. So that would tell me that there, somebody smart looked, saw there was no injuries and was like, look, I made three. That, that's what I think it should be. So I'm going to take all this numerical value without knowing that maybe there's something nefarious going on behind the scenes. Um, and obviously they you know, lost by a lot. But the fact that, you know, there there was even some buyback, it wasn't like some grand sweeping conspiracy across the country. It was probably just a small group that had knowledge or or had a relationship with somebody. If, if that's what's going on, then uh, not everybody who's in on it because the fact that it went back the other way right at the final seconds or, or leading up to game time tells me someone didn't know. I, I like how you said if it was somebody smart because that's exactly the kind of thing that I would do and that's why I always end up uh... – donating my money to bet MGM. Listen, Jim, I appreciate the time. Thank you for providing some insight on what happened here. And uh, as always, we'll see you soon, man. I'm going to see you in Vegas, right? We're going to, you're going to be out there. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. All, all kinds of shows and uh, we'll be, we'll be doing shows there ourselves. And I'm sure we'll run into each other, at least at the blackjack table. Come on. Yeah. You better, you better not big time me. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I wouldn't dare. <laughs> all right. I'll see you, man.